and the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. That conflict. I'm, I'm, I'll repeat myself what I've said publicly. That the Congo, like all of us, we inherited colonial boundaries. And when the colonialists drew up the boundaries of the Democratic Republic of Congo, they included in the eastern parts of the Congo populations that were Rwanda speaking. These are Congolese in terms of those colonial borders. But the problem for us and problem for the Congolese is that certainly even during the days of Mobutu, they did not, did not want to recognize the Rwandese who were Congolese as Congolese. You even had a formation there in the Eastern Congo of a military group, a militia, which was called the Mai Mai. The Mai Mai was, was, whose purpose was to drive away these Rwandans back to Rwanda. And Mobutu was encouraging that. That problem persists to this day. As you know, the Congo, the DRC is a very big country. And one of the challenges since the return of democracy, which was there before, it repasses, is the footprint of the government from Kinshasa is not necessarily strong everywhere in the country. So in the Kivus, this is part of the con problem, in the Kivus in the Far East, that's why you have the M23. Is because the Rwandan people, the Banyamulenge in the Eastern Congo, have for many decades felt this that they don't have the protection of the government in Kinshasa. So they need to protect themselves. In addition, you've had this challenge uh, of the people who committed genocide in Rwanda, then they ran away into the Eastern Congo. So they are also there. Some of them involved in all sorts of schemes and naturally to try and overthrow the government in Rwanda. I'm saying that the first, my view, is the first part in terms of dealing with the crisis in the Eastern Congo is recognizes that the Banyamulenge are Congolese. The Rwandan speaking section of the population of the Congo is Congolese. And therefore must be protected by the government of the Congo like all the population of the Congo is entitled to protection by the government. That's a starting point. And then this issue has to be dealt with. Then what about the interests of Rwanda in the Eastern Congo about the Rwandans? This group that committed the suicide, genocide, as well as these Rwandan-speaking people. How do you regulate that relationship? But I'm saying the principal responsibility falls on the government of, of the Congo to protect the Rwandan-speaking population of the Eastern Congo, of the Kivus. I think an understanding of those issues, why the coups d'etat in West Africa, why this commotion in the Congo, we must, fortunately we are, as members of this particular school, as it was explained, we must be the first ones to understand the objective reality. What is the reality we are dealing with? Not necessarily to be, by, to be bought by slogans, as popular sayings, because they are popular, therefore they must be true. That's not necessarily correct.
The question, Your Excellency, is why is the African Union or SADC does not use your expertise as a peacekeeping person, especially that you've got cordial and brother relationships with President Kagame. We can capitalize on those relationships with President Kagame that I personally know that you have to try and help the situation Kigali than being and, and DRC than being hostile. That's the question. <laughs> yes, but the time. <laughs> you see, you see, look at the hands, look at the hands, look at the hands, and I'm being unfair to everyone. So let's allow the president to, if he allows us to take a second chance, I will do that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'll have to be very brief, no, like the, not like the last time. I want to say, first of all, thanks a lot to the Ambassador of Senegal. Because indeed, as she says, uh, I contacted her and said, Ambassador, please, here is a task. We need to speak to President Makisal because here is a challenge. And indeed, she actually responded, which is not normal, Ambassador to actually said, I have delivered your message. Thanks a lot, Ambassador. <clears throat> but really, I'm, I'm very, very proud of what President Makisal has done. I've worked with the President Makisal for quite a, long, quite a long time. So I was fairly confident when I spoke to him, I raised the matter with him to say, but here is a challenge, a common challenge we both of us understand. And this is how I think Senegal should behave. Uh, I'm really very, very proud of the manner in which he responded to that. The, the, uh, nobody has spoken to me about what to do about the DRC here at home. They haven't. I don't know why, but they haven't. Uh, next month, uh, Rwanda will be marking the 30th anniversary of the genocide. Uh, I, I, President Kagame has sent an invitation, I'll be going there. Because I think for us, all of us as Africans, that that's an important anniversary to mark in order to address these issues about peace and stability on our continent. Um, in a sense, the, the issue about peace, uh, well, let me come at it differently. You'd recall that uh, our colleagues in East Africa, this African community, decided to send a group into the Congo to help resolve the challenges in the Eastern Congo. It was led by President Uhuru Kenyatta. Now he contacted me to say, I've been appointed in this thing, what do you think? So we discussed the matter, and indeed I told him what I thought, that uh, the first challenge to really to overcome is to get the Congolese to understand that is a Congolese problem. It doesn't originate from outside of the Congo. You remember even when we had the negotiations with the Congolese, when they met here in Sun City to negotiate the transition to democracy and so on, one of the negotiating groups there was the RCD. And the RCD was an armed group. There were three armed groups. The RCD was one of them, which came out of the Kivus. Because of the population in the Kivus felt the need to defend itself. So it actually had an armed representative in the negotiations to negotiate the future of the Congo. 
That's a reality that was understood by the Congolese themselves. They didn't say, RCD, you are not wanted here. So they were part of the solution. But I'm saying that I think the matter about this peace in the, uh, in the Eastern Kong, in the Eastern DRC, has become too factionalized. Because I saw somewhere on the television that uh, somebody asked one of the Congolese, but with the East Africans came here and so on, now we are getting the Southern Africans. What happened? And the response was, no, no, we don't want those, we didn't want those East Africans because they, they were very deceitful. They didn't tell us that in fact they supported Rwanda. Therefore we chased them away. I, I immediately understood what he meant. Because indeed uh, uh, President Kenyatta, leading that East African group, engaging the Congolese government, raised this thing to say, but the Rwandans in the Eastern Congo are Congolese. You've got to treat them as, as, as Congolese. That was interpreted as, therefore, you are in support of Rwanda, go away. In a sense, you've got to find a way of depoliticizing the matter so that it can be dealt with objectively. Yeah. In the first instance by the African Union, which is facing its own challenges. One of the interesting phenomena in West Africa, well, let me not necessarily, let me stay West Africa, but say something else. You know, there will be a, a I think somebody mentioned this earlier, there will be elections in Senegal later this month, the presidential elections. Now what had happened uh, in Senegal was that uh, over the last two years or so, uh, the most popular person in terms of the opposition had got into trouble, got arrested and charged and so on. In the, in the end, I think he got charged for something, found guilty on the charge of corrupting the youth, uh, something like that, sentenced. Uh, by far the most popular politician, I'm talking about a gentleman called Usman Sonko. Uh, so that is in jail. And people were killed in Senegal demonstrating against his arrest and imprisonment. Genuinely popular figure. So, uh, because of this concern about democracy on the continent, and Senegal stands out on the continent as the one of the few countries on the continent which has never had a military coup. Since independence in 1960, there's never been a coup there. You'd have elections and then the incumbent parties lose elections and new ones take over. But there was a crisis now because here is the most popular leader who's opposite side of the president in another party, but is in jail. So, uh, so we engaged, we engaged with President, President Makisal to say, but President, uh, Senegal is very, very important on the continent as this great exemplar, exemplar of democracy. It illustrates very, very firmly, very conclusively that we as Africans know how to manage democratic systems. And we can't afford to have Senegal fall back on that. And therefore, let the matter of Usman Songo, who wants to run for president, let that matter be decided by the voters, not by prison orders. Yeah. And just before I came here, I saw a lovely report that President Makisal has intervened, uh, declared an amnesty all the prisoners out of jail, including Usman Sonko. Uh, and pardoned various charges, 
as a result of which Usman Sonko is running for president. That was uh, <clears throat> an excellent intervention made by the president of Senegal. Precisely to say it's, it's a responsibility of the Senegalese or the rest of us to defend this democracy, particularly you raised quite correctly in the context of the military takeovers that have been taking place, particularly in West Africa. But I think we've got to understand this about the West Africa situation. You know, uh, a few years back, you remember we had to work with, the, uh, with Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire to help them to get sorted out. And one of the things that we found was that there was an agreement with France signed at the point of the independence of Cote d'Ivoire that France would maintain a military barracks in Abidjan, the capital. And the commander of the French troops in any situation where he felt the security of Cote d'Ivoire or the security of France was threatened, he had the power, sovereign power, a French general, to take over the public station broadcasting and announce whatever he liked. It's one of the agreements, one of the 12 or so agreements. that not only Cote d'Ivoire, but many countries of the Francophone, the Francophone countries that signed with France at independence. Mali, Mali just now, has just repudiated all of those agreements. I think there were 11 or 12 of them, which include prescriptions about when you've generated a foreign currency, bank it in Paris. Yeah. And Paris, the French franc then would guarantee your currency, CFA. Part of what is happening uh, in, uh, in West Africa, Palisa, as you can see, is a rebellion by young officers against French neocolonialism. It's not only military coups to remove uh, some elected president, but these young soldiers are saying, our politics since independence has respected this junior relationship with France. That must end. So you see the big confrontation between these countries and France. It has to do with ending, the, like the agreements I've talked about that you'd have a French general based in Cote d'Ivoire who has actually the power to intervene in Cote d'Ivoire as he liked. So it's, it's an anti-neocolonial rebellion. It has got this element, you are quite correct, of a, removing a elected presidents. How does the continent deal with that? Well, you know, the OAU has a standard policy, as you, as you mentioned, uh, against illegal changes of government. So, the military governments don't get recognized. But we have a particular consequence now. We are Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, designed that they are walking out of ECOWAS. Now that can't be a positive development. What is to be done? It's not a question that we can answer here. But I think, again, I'm trying to say, it's necessary for us to understand the objective reality. What actually is happening? It's not just young soldiers who are hungry for power and therefore remove this elected president, no. That's why they talk about Thomas Sankar. 
Sankara took power by coup d'etat. He was a soldier. But Sankara understood this particular issue, the need to destroy, destroy and defeat neocolonialism. And that's what these young soldiers are saying. What do we do with them? What does Africa do with them? I think Africa is an, an, a challenge, a problem, answering that issue, answering that question. Uh, do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about, African politics, economy, and increasing power. Thanks for watching, and until the next video, stay tuned. Tell us what you think in the comment section. Like and share the video, and subscribe so that you don't miss any of our African videos. It's the best way to support us.